Canaan Christian Church, a simple church with a kingdom focus. With our pastor, Dr. Walter Malone Jr., we dare to dream, connecting one with God and one with one another. We teach the Word of God through Connection Group and Wednesday Bible Studies. The Word of God is declared and celebrated each Sunday morning. Through prayer, we build our relationship with God and one another. We proclaim the Word of God locally and globally. The Canaan Christian Church is a great church because we glorify God and seek to spiritually edify the people of God. Let's prepare our hearts and minds for the Word of God. Good morning. Good morning to everyone and welcome to our Connection Group Bible Study. I greet you, as always, with the joy of the Lord. Let's go before the Lord in prayer and we will open up our study. Father, in the name of Jesus, O oh Lord God, we come before you humbly, yet boldly, but we also come to say thank you, God. Thank you, Lord, for all the many blessings that you have blessed us with. Thank you, God, for allowing us to be in the midst, Lord Jesus, as the word will be taught. And thank you, God, for being on the receiving end of every good and perfect gift that comes from you. We thank you, God, for this lesson, and we thank you, God, for those persons that will share and partake, God, in the study of your word. We pray also, God, that we would take the word, hide it in our hearts so that we might not sin against you. But then we would also take this same word, God, and share it with someone else, someone that needs either encouragement or someone that needs to come on the Lord's side. Help us, God, to be ambassadors of Jesus Christ. Help us, God, to be living epistles and help us, God, to walk worthy, God, of being called Christians. And so, God, we bless you in advance for what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. Have your way and have your way. It is in the mighty name of Jesus that we do pray, and we give you the thanks, and let every heart say amen. And amen again, as always. We are so excited to have everyone that is tuned in for our Bible study this morning, and whether you have joined us through our YouTube or Canaan streaming broadcast ministry platforms, we certainly welcome you. To our virtual members and covenant partners, we are so blessed to have you in our presence this morning. To our Canaan members that may not uh, be back in the sanctuary, welcome to Bible study. And then certainly to our visitors, so glad to have you join us this morning. We're going to make our way now through the book of Genesis last uh, Sunday, uh, you received the lesson from um, my friend and sister Janice Gallo. So I want to thank her publicly for covering last Sunday's lesson, especially as it relates to uh, the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Today, though, our lesson is entitled Blessed. Blessed, and it's going to be coming from Genesis chapter 30, verses 25 through 34, and then we'll jump down to verses 41 through 43 in order to um, finish out our study. Now, the main idea, the focal statement, the underlying application of our lesson is that God is faithful to bless his people. God is faithful to bless his people. And we know that our God is not short on blessings. We know our God is more than well able and is such a generous and loving God that he's always in a posture of wanting to bless us. The question is, how bad do we want to be blessed, right? And there is a song, and it's so interesting because it's a wonderful song, and we're familiar with Great Is Thy Faithfulness. Amen. Um, and then we're certainly familiar with the line, Morning by morning new mercies I see. It's because of the Lord's faithful love, hallelujah, that we do not perish. And so I have a little bit of an, an interesting piece that is related to that because the writer of that song, was his name was Thomas Chisholm. And he was actually born in Franklin, Kentucky in 1866. 
um, and because of health problems, he either you know would be employed gainfully, and then other times maybe not so much, just because of the illness that he had. So over time, he would have worked in the fields of teaching, journalism, insurance, and evang evangelism. That is uh, quite a resume, right? But the beautiful part about it is that through all of his ups and through all of his downs, he focused on the new blessings that he received from God every morning. Hence then we have the song that he penned, Great is Thy Faithfulness. And so we as well ought to find ourselves in a posture no matter what it is. Paul said that uh, whatever state that he has found himself in, that he is content, whether he is abased or abound, right? And so that's what the posture that we ought to find ourselves in. We're saved, God loves us, and we know that he does. We're blessed. We have the favor of the Lord, the grace of God upon our lives. We are uniquely blessed. Now, the other piece of the blessing, though, that we want to see, even as before we get into this lesson, is that when God blesses us, and we know that he does, and we know that he has, when he blesses us, it's not just to bless us. The blessings come to us, but we ought to be willing and open um, and, and, and just readily able to share the blessings that God has given to us. The blessings that he has blessed us with ought to be channeled through us. Somebody else ought to receive and be a benefactor of the blessings that God has given to us. Now, let's go ahead and jump into the understanding the context because there's a lot to cover. We finished in Genesis, before we went to um, um, last Sunday's lesson to the resurrection, we were in Genesis chapter number 28, I believe. Um, and then there's a lot that's taking place between where we were in 28 to where we're going to be. And in fact, our understanding the context is going to cover all of chapter 29 through the end of chapter 31. So that's a lot of ground to cover. But so that we can kind of get caught up, at least from where we were in chapter number 28, if you remember, um, Jacob at the very beginning of chapter 28 was forced to leave uh, his home because Esau planned to kill him. That was the plan. He was going to take him out because he had stolen the patriarchal blessing that was supposed to have gone to his twin brother Esau. And then we see in the very beginning of chapter number 28 that Isaac restates the blessing before sending him off. Then when we go down a little bit further, what we covered on last, um, well, the last time that we covered Genesis, we talked about the stairway or the ladder, the dream that um, Jacob has. So as Jacob is on his way to uh, Paran Aram, there at the well, he sees the love of his life. He sees Sister Rachel, um, who was at that time shepherding the flocks of her father Laban. And he's actually on a journey um, going specifically to Rebecca's brother which is his uncle, which is Uncle Laban. So once everything kind of pans out, Rebecca's generosity and hospitality is such that she welcomes him after having uh, watered all of, um, that's a different lesson, Lord have mercy. Jesus, I went all the way back to, um, to Isaac's wife because there's such a big parallel, so please forgive me. But at, as Ra Rachel was there, she was shepherding the flocks of Laban. <laughs> so she was shepherding the flocks of Laban. There's a lot of uh, similarities between Rachel and Rebecca. Rebecca. So what ends up happening is that Jacob stays with Laban and agrees to work seven years uh, for the love of his life, Rachel. He loved her that much. But what ends up happening after the wedding celebration um, and then uh, Laban brings to uh, Jacob um, what should have been his wife, Re uh, Rachel, ended up being his older daughter, Leah, instead. And so I'm not going to stay here too long because we got to get to the focal text, but this is kind of like the beginning of Jacob um, kind of getting uh, somewhat of a turnabout is fair play of his deceptive practices that he had with not only Esau, but with his father, Isaac. He was beginning to reap some of the deception that he had previously uh, 
sown. But Jacob, because of the love that he has for Rachel, agrees to work another seven years to marry Rachel. In between there, um, in chapters, starting in probably chapter 29, um, about number 15 or so, and then we keep reading, we have the litany of the births of all of Jacob's children. All in all, um, he had um, 12 sons and one daughter. And you'll have to go back and read this for yourself because the similarities bear themselves out again um, as it has to do with Rachel. Um, well, yeah, first Leah, the older, the first woman that he married, gave him six sons. But all that while, Rachel was unable to conceive. Then the Lord remembered Rachel, but in between him remembering Rachel and her giving birth um, as well, she had bore um, a son, um, Benjamin, um, and Joseph. So before all of that, she had her maid, Bilhah, to have sex with her husband, Jacob, in order to bear her some sons. Sounds familiar, does it not? But at the end of the day, the um, 12 sons that were born to Jacob, Leah, Rachel, and the two uh, maidservants then make up what would be, then be the 12 tribes of Israel. Amen. But here's what we need to see. The longer that Jacob stayed in Parah Haram, he was blessed. God blessed him and multiplied his flocks. He ended up being there for 20 years, 14 for each of his wives. And then you'd read it again if you go through it and read at the end of chapter number 30, another six years for his flock. So all between that time, God is blessing Jacob. He's becoming wealthy far beyond anything he would have ever imagined. And much of his wealth came at the expense of Laban. Yes, I'm staying a little bit longer on the context because it carries over to our focal text. Now, what we need to understand is that at some point in time, Jacob realized that Laban's attitude toward him had changed. And throughout all of these 20 years, Laban had changed the amount of his wages more than once, more than twice. He had cheated Jacob, but even with all that going on, the Lord continued to bless um, Jacob and continued to keep the promise that he made to him at Bethel where he had um, the dream. And so because he had, that being God, been with Jacob, Jacob was protected and God continued to bless him. But at a certain point after two decades had gone by, God was ready to fulfill the final part of his promise. We're not there yet. That's going to be in chapter number 31, which I think we're going to end up skipping as far as the teaching on Sunday is concerned. We are. But rest assured, if you're doing your reading, you should be well, you should already know. I'm not spoiling anything because we're well past Genesis in our reading plan through the year. <laughs> Amen. Let's go to the first section, which is entitled Past. Um, in fact, the lesson is broken up into three sections, past, present, and future. So in the first section, past, we're going to cover Genesis chapter 30, verses 25 through 30. Let's read. After Rachel gave birth to Joseph, Jacob said to Laban, send me on my way so that I can return to my homeland. Give me my wives and my children that I have worked for and let me go. You know how hard I have worked for you. But Laban said to him, if I have found favor with you, stay. I have learned by divination that the Lord has blessed me because of you. 
Then, J then Laban said, name your wages and I will pay them. So Jacob said to him, you know how I have served you and how your herds have fared with me. For you have had very little before I came, but now your wealth has increased. The Lord has blessed you because of me. And now when will I do something for my own family? Hmm, that's quite interesting. We're looking at family dynamics. Certainly this is Old Testament. And this is a, a little bit different than it is today, but the, di the dynamics are still quite uh, vital and active. Now, the main idea of this first section past is that believers can be encouraged by God's past blessings. Amen. Believers can be encouraged by God's past blessings. And if we look at the past, if we were to go all the way back to chapter 28, right after uh, Jacob has left his home and as he is making his way in his journey to Padar Aram, then he has this dream. And we read, I think it's in chapter 31, that when he did leave home, he left with his staff, meaning the staff that you would use as a herder. Amen. Basically, that's all he had. And so when we talk about past blessings, and that means you got to look to the past. Well, well, what did Jacob had when he left home? He had basically nothing. And not only did he have little in the way of um, physical items, he also had left his family. He had to leave his mother who we don't know, we, we don't read in, in scripture whether or not he ever saw her again. He had to leave his father knowing that he had uh, been deceitful with his father as he was aged and couldn't see. And then he had to deal with the fact of what he did to his brother Esau. So basically, Jacob, um, when he left, he left with nothing. And when he arrived in Haran, which is part of Parah Aram, uh, he had an empty jar. He had nothing. He, it was a, a clean slate, a new start, and whatever he was going to have, God would be the one to have to bless him for it. So he worked for Laban, right? And as he worked for Laban, God blessed him. As he worked for Laban, God showed him himself. As he worked for Laban, things started to turn around. He could see himself and what he had done in the past, how God was not pleased. But look at what God is doing in and through my life now. God was faithful to Jacob and God provided for him. Now in verse number 25, we read, after Rachel gave birth to Joseph. Now, we've already talked about all the different children. We talked about the fact that Leah had six children, while all the time during that period of time, um, Rachel was actually barren. Now, we also know that between the two wives that Jacob favored Rachel. And of the two wives, Leah and Rachel, she was the youngest. And so, we remember that he has uh, put his life on hold, basically, to be a servant and work for um, her um, father, Laban, in order to be able to have her as his wife, having agreed to work those seven years, which he did so. But then, of course, we just talked about it after the celebration. Oops, sorry, not Rachel, it's Leah. So then... Then Jacob ended up working another seven years to marry Rachel. And in that time, she bore him two sons after God remembered her and released her from her barrenness. She bore Joseph. Joseph ends up being um, Jacob's favorite son. And then she actually died while giving birth to her uh, last son, Benjamin. And I do want to read this because there is... Um, in Matthew chapter 2, verse 18, we're not going to stay here, but I do just want to read it for your hearing. There's a reference to Rachel. It's actually in Jeremiah, but then it's referenced um, in Matthew as it relates to um, her weeping in connection with Herod the Great. It has to do with the fact that she is symbolized as the mother of Israel in these verses very quickly Matthew chapter 2 verse number 
uh, we'll probably start in verse number 16. Um, yes, so starting at verse number 16 of Matthew chapter 2, when Herod saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, he was infuriated, and he sent and killed all the children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken through the prophet Jeremiah. A voice was heard in Ramah, wailing and loud lamentation. Rachel, weeping for her children, her children Israel. She refused to be consoled because they are no more. I just wanted, it was referenced in my studying and I wanted to share that with you that, um, and, and it makes sense though, because Rachel was married to Jacob. Jacob, his name is changed to Israel. And then we have their 12 sons who then uh, formulate and make up the 12 tribes of Israel. So Rachel gives birth to Joseph, and then Laban, Jacob has a conversation with Laban. He's ready. It's time. He's like, look. He said, give me my wives, verse number 26. Give me my children. I've worked for all of that. You treated me as your servant more so than a son-in-law. He said, and let me go. And he, and he tells him, you know I've worked for you, and you know how hard I've worked for you. And Laban was a very dedicated and skilled shepherd at that. But Laban says to him, so Laban is still tricky ricky a little bit, right? And he says, if I have found favor with you, stay. Well, first of all, I haven't. You found favor with me. He says, I have learned by divination that the Lord has blessed me because of you. Now, that divination uh, or divination, some people pronounce it differently, but this has to do with uh, making decisions or foretelling the future by reading signs and omens. And there were different ways, I'll share with you a couple, that they did that. But let's be clear that the Bible, when it's referring to divination, <laughs> that it is condemned in scriptures. It is a, a practice that is not accepted because what he's basically saying is that he has learned by some other means than the Lord God, the Lord God of Abraham, having revealed to him that he has blessed because of Jacob. And so a couple of other ways and examples of this divination could be the color, size, and position of an animal's liver would possibly be considered if making choices or maybe determining the fate of someone, pouring out arrows after shaking them in a quiver, uh, helping to, them to decide possibly um, where an army should attack an enemy. And also people also practiced uh, divination by looking into a cup that was filled with liquid. So there were all different kinds of ways. And most of the time we find when we're reading that the Egyptians, the, Phil the Philistines, and the Babylonians mm -hmm, engaged in divination. But we already know that, as I said before, that the Lord condemned such practices. Because when we look at that, the reality is that those that practice those type of things are those that are trying to circumvent the Lord to find guidance for the future. They're trying to do anything but seek God, his face in prayer, the word. Other than that, they're trying to see everything else. Crystal balls, that's not going to do it. Waving certain, mm -mm, that's not going to do it. Yeah, read my palm, come on somebody, right? So those are not the ways of Christians, hallelujah. But Laban is real clear, this is how I know that the Lord has blessed me because of you. And then he goes on and he says, name your wages. Now Laban has taken this man through for almost 20 years. And when we look at the word um, wages, the word wages has to do, and we're looking at it a little bit deeper when we look at the next section, has to do with pay, but it also could be related to reward. And he says, now name your wages and I will pay them. And so Jacob is learned a lot. And he says, Jacob says to him, you know how I have served you and how your herds have fared with me. 
For you had very little before I came, but now your wealth has increased. In that statement, Jacob is making sure that Laban understands, look, I know that my being here has blessed you beyond anything that you could have ever imagined, that what you had before I got here doesn't even closely measure up to what you have since I have been here. And he says, the Lord has blessed me, I'm sorry, the Lord has blessed you because of me. That is a direct statement from Jacob. And Jacob's like, look, the Lord has blessed you because of me. Now, when do I get to live my life? Now can I do something for my what? My own family. And Jacob lists his wives and his children uh, as those that he is trying to now provide for on his, home, on his own. I won't be your servant anymore. <laughs> I, 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 there's more to this life than this. I, I'm your son-in-law, but you're treating me like a slave to some degree. So <laughs> Jacob says, when do I get to have something for my own family? The next section is verses 31 through 34. We'll continue on before we have a little bit of that break. And this section is entitled Present. The main idea is that believers should demonstrate honesty in every area, including their business dealings. Isn't that interesting that that would be the application statement, the focal statement for this particular section. But when we're looking at this, one of the things that we need to talk about is the fact that there was no quote unquote currency. There was no money at that time. And so um, having flocks, sheep and goat was a sign of how much wealth someone had. You can go back and if you go back and read um, the story of Job and it's very clear in listing all that he had because that was as a representation of his wealth. And so the same thing holds true here as well. So in verse number 31, as we read, Laban asked, well, what should I give you? And Jacob said, you don't need to give me anything. If you do this one thing for me, I will continue to shepherd and keep your flock. Let me go through all your sheep today and remove every sheep that is speckled or spotted, even dark colored sheep among the lambs and the spotted and speckled among the female goats. Such will be my wages. We'll come back to that. In the future, when you come to check on my wages, my honesty will testify for me. If I have any female goats that are not speckled or spotted or any lambs that are not black, they will be considered stolen. Good, said Laban, let it be as you have said. So Laban, again, Rebecca's brother, Lee and Rachel's father, Uncle Laban, had originally been the ones that had granted Rebecca permission to go and to marry Isaac. And so we've just, we talked about this in the context. Now Jacob is having to go back to the same place at Paran Aram. And in doing so, Jacob has really met his match. He is really, yeah, you know, we know that Jacob's name means twister, right? Uh, supplanter, uh, deceiver. Yes, not good words to describe <laughs> your life. But now in Laban, it's, it's, it's game on, right? And so we've already talked about he's been there for 20 years, seven years to work for um, his wife, Rachel, got tricked, seven years to work for Rachel again, and then six years, which we'll see in just a moment as it relates to the goats and his flock, I should say. So Laban says, what should I give you? And Jacob said, you don't need to give me anything. So Jacob already knows that God is the one who has blessed him, is blessing him, and shall bless him. And he has lined this out. He said, if you do this one thing for me, so we're going to see this one thing in just a minute. But he says, if you do this one thing for me, I will continue to shepherd and keep your flock. Now, we want to look at that word shepherd uh, very quickly because that word shepherd um, here is used as a verb, but we typically will read it as well as a noun. It is his occupation. It's what he does as work for Laban. And so then we also know that shepherd, of course, cared for sheep, sheep, 
by leading them to pasture, leading them to water, guarding and protecting them from those outside elements and animals that would seek to destroy them. Now we also know that the term shepherd later came to designate Israel's kings. Some of them are not very good shepherds, right? So the kings and leaders would also be termed as shepherds. Um, now, again, sheep represented wealth. And some of the reasons why that the sheep represented wealth because they provided food, milk, wool, and leather. They also served as major offerings in the sacrificial system, which we have studied that before. But then take it further, we also know in uh, Psalm 23 that David then um, identifies the Lord as his shepherd. And then later, Jesus in John chapter 10, verse 11, identifies himself as the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. So that word shepherd is broad in its dis description. So then... Jacob lines out, let me go through all your sheep, and he talks about the ones that he's going to remove, the speckled, the spotted, and every dark-colored sheep, and then that's through the, the, the lambs, and then the spotted and the speckled of the female goats. He says, this will be my wage. And so when we talk about the word wage, it has to do with rendering something to someone for their services. But in this particular book and in earlier in chapter 30 in verse number 18 the term is rendered as well as rewarded and I said that earlier so late literally when Laban gave um no I'm sorry Leah when she stated that God had given her her wages as it related to the birth of one of her sons Issachar that's what she was talking about that it wasn't wages as if as of earned but it was wages as of rewarded and so the beautiful part about it in our relationship with God the Father we are called servants oftentimes servants of the most high God but God never hires his servants we do what we do for God out of love and out of gratitude amen and so then in verse number 33 then Jacob says in the future when you come to check on my wages my honesty will testify to me now that word honesty can also be uh, rendered as righteousness or justice but it basically means that someone is conforming to a moral standard being honest and having integrity ought to be a moral standard especially in the lives of believers and in the old testament the standard is the lord's nature and the lord's will but honesty involves more than just relating correctly to God. It also has to do encompasses relating and relationships with other people. And so Jacob here, is, he said, I'm going to continue to shepherd your flock, but only if I can own all the ones that we just listed, the speckled, the spotted, the dark, all of those. And so because typically not always, but typically speckled animals typically would produce speckled animals like, uh, like kind would produce like kind, then Laban could then check Jacob's honesty. Amen. Now, after all of that, Laban does say, uh, he says, good, <laughs> okay, and let it be as you have said. Um, and so there's a couple of things here, a few things that go a little bit further or ahead in chapter 31, because what we find is that even though Jacob is lined this out about all the different colored, speckled, spotted, all of that, Laban still could not refrain from being who he was, which is a deceiver. So he could not refrain from uh, deception. And so what ends up happening, and we see this a little bit further down, we'll cover this in just a moment because I'm going to read these verses 35 through 39, kind of make up the gap here. Um, and so at the end of the day, Laban 
um, goes and he takes all of Jacob's uh, lamb, lambs, sheep, and all of his goats. And this is even after the, you know, I don't want to say the deal, but it was more of a bargain. It was more of bartering versus waging. Um, and we'll see that in just a moment because Jacob wasn't saying, pay me. Jacob was saying, if you do this, I'll do that. If you do that, I'll do this. So it was more of a barter or bargaining. But at the end of the day, Laban was already ahead of the game if he would have just left things as they were and honored what he had set up with Jacob. So let's look at that, and that'll help kind of bring it all together because um, our focal text takes us through verse 34, but we're going to jump down to verses 35 through 40. We need to just go ahead and read them. I will not be able to teach them, um, but we will go ahead and read them so that we're clear about what has taken place here. Um, verse number 35, but the day Laban removed the male goats, but that day Laban removed the male goats that were striped and spotted and all the female goats that were speckled and spotted, every one that had white on it and every lamb that was black and put them in charge of his sons. So he gave those particular animals as they were. He gave them um, under the charge of his sons and he set a distance of three days journey between himself and Jacob while Jacob was pasturing the rest of Laban's flock. So he sends them away with all of um, what should have been Jacob's flock. And uh, Moses is telling us in his writing here in Genesis that there was a distance of three days of the journey. Verse 37, then Jacob took fresh rods of poplar and almond and plain and peeled white streaks in them, exposing the white of the rods. He set the rods that he had peeled in front of the flocks in the troughs, that is the watering places where the flocks came to drink. And since they bred when they came to drink, the flocks bred in front of the rods, and so the flocks produced young that were striped, speckled, and spotted. Amen. That takes us right into our lesson, just about. I think I have one more verse. Jacob separated the lambs. Yes, verse 40. Jacob separated the lambs and set the faces of the flocks toward the striped and the completely black animals in the flock of Laban. And he put his own droves apart and did not put them into Laban's flock. Mm. So I can't go into this, but Laban thought he was being slick by taking out all of those speckled and spotted and uh, dark um, parts of the flock, and he sends them away with his sons. But then Jacob, which we'll see in a little bit, actually does something as well. Um, that one could possibly question as it relates to the human effort that had been put in trying to achieve God's plan his own way. And that would be Jacob as well. Um, because there's a dream in chapter 31, starting at verse number 10. I'm going to read that very quickly. A dream that Jacob has that then basically has formed the basis of this plan that he has outlined to Laban. So we don't know 100% whether or not the dream took place before he made this deal, if you will, with Laban. Or was Jacob trusting the Lord to multiply his flocks and his herds? So at the end of the day, because of the human effort that we just read about in these verses 35 through 40, it does tend to lean on the side that Jacob may have been trying to achieve what God had already declared by his own means. However, <laughs> at the end of the day, uh, Jacob still 
only prospered because of God's grace. And that's one thing that we do have to remember. If we prosper, and in this particular instance, because God had already promised, it was because of God's grace. Amen. And just very quickly, just so that we had, can read it to, together in uh, Genesis chapter 31, verses 10 through 12. Very, very interesting because this dream basically lines out everything that, that Jacob had said to Laban when kind of setting up this bartering, this deal. Um, in verse number 10, it says, during the mating of the flock, I once had a dream in which I looked up and saw that the male goats that leaped upon the flock were striped, speckled, and modeled. Then the angel of God said to me in the dream, Jacob, and I said, here I am. And he said, look up and see that all the goats that leap on the flock are striped, speckled, and mottled. For I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. And then in verse 13, um, God says, I am the God of Bethel, which it's not a part of our lesson. But if you go back two weeks to the lesson uh, related to the stairway, and the fact that that uh, Jacob named that 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 place um, that there was a pillar that had been um, planted and produced, and he worshipped there, but he named that place Bethel, Beth meaning house, and El God. Isn't that wonderful? But then God then comes back here later on in chapter thirty-one when Jacob has this dream, and he refers to himself in the dream as the God of. Bethel. I'm not going back to the pillars. I'm not going back to um, where we, you know, may have to stop and plant some some pillars and um, some not monuments, but some spiritual markers of what it is that God has done for us. I'm gonna keep moving because that part right there might take us in and over. Let's now go to the latter part of our study. We've read verses 35 through 40. Now we're in verses 41 through 43. And the title of this section is Future, Future. The main idea is that believers can celebrate God's blessings in their lives. Believers can celebrate God's blessings in their lives. Whenever the stronger of the flock were breeding, there's some inference there as it relates to the rods um, that Jacob had set up where the um, flock was would water and take in their water that somehow that might have made them stronger. Whenever the stronger of the flock were breeding, Jacob placed the branches in the troughs in full view of the flocks and they would breed in front of the branches. As for the weaklings of the flocks, he did not put out the branches. So it turned out that the weak sheep belonged to Laban and the stronger ones to Jacob. And the man became very rich. He had many flocks, female and male slaves and camels and donkeys. So that first word we wanna look at is the word stronger. It is a Hebrew term. And it basically means to bind or to tie. And so, and there's, there's another uh, definition as well, but it also occurs, this word stronger, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 8, where the Lord had commanded his people to bind his words or his laws, what? On their hands and on their foreheads. We've read about that before, previously. But then also there is this binding that can be with people. We are bound in Christian love and the relationship that we have one to another. We should be bound in family love and devotion. And then also we go a little bit further in Genesis in chapter 44, verse 30. The, the verb is rendered as wrapped up and it depicts this relationship that Jacob had, very close relationship between himself and his son, Benjamin. So those are more probably um, positive descriptions of to bind or to tie. Um, but it can also be binding itself, just the word sometimes when you think about it, but it can be somewhat restrictive, but it can also provide strength. And so here in these verses, the term, what we're looking at, 
um, and the concept is of being strong, being robust or vigorous. So these animals were the best of the flock that Jacob was managing. What did I say earlier? That Jacob was um, a skilled shepherd. He knew what he was doing whenever the stronger of the flock were breeding. So we know what breeding is, but just so we can get um, an understanding of where the word comes from, it's also a Hebrew word that basically means to be hot. And the form of the verb that we're using, that's used here, in Genesis uh, 30 verse 41 means to be in heat and we've heard that before as well um, so this noun of course here in this particular text refers to the sexual arousal among animals which can also mean quietly as is kept anger <laughs> and so we're talking about the word not necessarily the animals because we remember further back in Genesis 27 right before um, Jacob steals uh, Esau's blessing we see the response that that Esau had and it was one of anger so when the stronger of the flocks were, bre were breeding, Jacob placed the branches in the troughs in full view of the flocks and they would breed in front of the branches. So these branches possibly came from poplar, almond, and plane trees, P-L-A-N-E. And he would peel, Jacob would peel the bark off of the branches and would expose these white stripes underneath. And so using the branches may, may, mm -hmm, have been part of a traditional folk custom in the region. But at the end of the day, God used it for Jacob's benefit. As for the weaklings, verse number 42, as for the weaklings of the flocks, he did not put out the branches. So at the end of the day, it turned out that the weak sheep belonged to Laban and the stronger ones belonged to Jacob. Sue Jesus, right there. You know, that was probably uh, some trouble, trouble, right? And the man became very rich. Now, we've talked a little bit about what rich was and what rich constituted in this particular context of time. But the phrase became very rich more literally probably means or refers to it was so much that it exceeded any limits that he may have thought he had. Basically, the verb means to break or to breach. Um, and, and it has all kinds of different variations of the meaning. When you use um, it of human beings, became very rich, the verb that relates to that. It often conveys malicious and destructive activity. And you can see that in 2 Kings chapter 14 and 13, um, but also the verb related to became very rich um, can also mean to increase. Mm -hmm. And that goes back to the reference that I had of Job earlier as well. But here with Jacob became very rich is often and more likely um, correctly attributed to and solely to God's grace. And then in verse number 43, the latter part, he had made flocks. He had many flocks female and male slaves and camels and donkeys. So we see something similar as to with um, our brother Joe, but there is um, a listing of what it is that Jacob had then amassed. And so there is the inclusion of the flocks, the cattle, the, the herds, and the different animals within that. But then there's also the mentioning of female and male slaves. So depending on the translation that you read, it could say servants. And that we know, um, we can go back to Abraham and Eleazar, um, that there are, is a different connotation to a degree as the status of slavery among the Israelites um, that oftentimes involved rights and oftentimes, sometimes, positions of trust. And there was a trust, there was a bond between Eleazar um, and um, Abraham. <clears throat> 
Um, and then the law also limited a fellow Israelite to be bonded for only six years, which is quite interesting. So now we, when we think or hear the word slaves, um, especially if we're thinking about in these United States as people were brought from um, Af Africa over uh, the waters in slave ships, that's not what we're talking about. <laughs> this, this is different. This is totally different. So then the other piece that we want to look at as far as the word servant has to do with sometimes we use the word or the phrase oftentimes as well, servant leaders. And so we have kings and we referenced that earlier that there were kings and there were leaders. But then also they had subjects which were considered to be or designated as their servants. And there were leaders such as Moses, such as Joshua, and they were recognized as the Lord's servants. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, was a position of honor. But then we have um, our ultimate high priest, our, the ultimate suffering servant in the person of our Messiah, Jesus the Christ. And then the last piece, which is interesting that they, that the writer named out these individual animals and the, we have camels and then we have donkeys. We'll look at the donkeys. Um, these particular animals served as uh, field animals or as transportation. What's a field animal? A field animal is an animal that works in the field, right? Um, helping to till the land. So there these donkeys possessed enough value and there was amazing that there is value in a donkey. The donkey possessed enough value that its firstborn had to be redeemed by sacrificing a lamb. Interesting. And then the animal's flesh could possibly even be consumed if it was a desperate famine situation. So oftentimes, mules and horses were associated with war. But donkeys were connected with peace and humility. And we know that ultimately, Jesus fulfilled the prophecy in Zechariah of the Messiah riding in on a donkey. The main idea out of this section was that believers can celebrate God's blessings in their lives. And we ought to. There's no shame in being blessed. And there's no reason for us to bow our head because God has generously blessed us. As long as, let's go back to the very beginning, and we talked about the fact that God blesses us, but it's not for us to just keep everything to ourselves. I'm getting convicted right here as I'm speaking. It's not for us to hoard. Help us, Lord. It's not for us to store up everything for ourselves or even ourselves and our families, but it's so that we can be used as a vessel, a conduit to bless others. Now, our key doctrine, which is last, but I'm so glad that it's positioned last in this lesson, the key doctrine is stewardship. Yeah, because ultimately, uh, we don't own anything as quiet as it's kept. We are blessed with the car that God has given us. We are blessed with the house that God has allowed us to be able to purchase. We are blessed with the jobs that God has graciously allowed us to get up and go to work and be thankful for. Amen? As Monday's coming, Monday's coming, I'm trying to help somebody. But ultimately, we don't own, we're stewards, even of the money that we earn. We don't. We're stewards. So stewardship. God is the source of all blessings, temporal and spiritual. All that we have and are, we owe to him. The references there are Psalm 50 verses 10 through 12 and then James chapter 1 verses 17 through 19. Well, that is the end of our lesson, and I certainly pray that you were blessed by the study of the word today. Next Sunday, we will be in Genesis chapter 32, verses 22 through 32, and the title of the lesson is Wrestled. Wrestled. Listen, don't go anywhere. Stay right where you are.
Our pastor will be with us in just a moment with another powerful word from the Lord. Be blessed. <laughs> 